welcome back. Okay, so we are starting to hit 10.45 now. Uh, for those of you who have not met me, my name is Ayush. I'm chairing this session here. So our first uh, uh, invited speaker is Facia from ENS Paris. If you did not know, ENS Paris was founded during the French Revolution. And now Facia will be talking about how to probably revolutionize imaging in living tissues using microscopy. So it's a 25-minute talk. Please enjoy and keep your questions ready. Okay. Please, welcome. Thank you, uh, Ayush, for the nice uh, introduction. And thank you, the organizer, for inviting me over. It's actually my first time being in ICCP, but I definitely enjoy it so far, and I'm considering coming back more times in the future. So today I'm gonna share with you my journey on combining optics, uh, particularly optical microscopy with computational methods to further enhance the imaging capability with microscopy. So I was trained uh, as a person in optics and now I'm joining uh, UC Irvine uh, in next uh, summer, uh, 2025 as assistant professor. And this is a, a example, uh, example project that I'm aiming to target uh, in my future lab as well. So to give you a brief uh, recap of what the microscopy image looks like, because you guys are all familiar uh, with camera images so far, and it, most of you have phones uh, to take images with a camera. But if you zoom in, for example, through a hand, uh, and to 10 times, you see a centimeter scale, and towards about uh, 1,000 zoom, uh, times zoom in, towards 10,000 times zoom in, you start to see and visualize the cells. Within, uh, within the tissue. And that is the regime of uh, the microscopist uh, cares about and biologist wants to uh, image to better understand how living tissue works at the cellular level. So the daily life or the tool the biologists really like to use is what we call a microscopy. And here I'm showing you a benchtop microscope uh, in a biological lab, which is a commercial uh, that's fluorescence confocal. And this microscope works by first staining a neurons, for example, with the, what we call a fluorophore. And in order to specifically image the neurons, we targeted a uh, label this neurons so that we excite with certain wavelengths, for example, a blue light here, and we let the neurons emit green fluorophores, which is what we call a one fluorescence photons excited by one blue photons. And that helps us to identify these specific neurons among many other neurons and targeted uh, to image that neuron. And in order to visualize how the beam is formed uh, during this excitation scheme, what we see here in this figure on the uh, top left-hand side is that, oh, oh that's too fancy, um, is that we, we see this uh, blue light coming in after the objective lens that goes into these fluorophores solutions. And within the solutions, it emits green fluorophores. And in order to form a very good uh, high-resolution 2D image of such neurons, we scan that specific laser point in order to form a 2D image. And to form a 3D image, the way to go is to actually scan these neurons and so that we form a 3D neurons. So what you see here right now is a very proud images set of biologists where you might see in Twitter every day they show uh, they want to showcase their beautiful uh, fluorescence images. And one issue out there is that even though they're so beautiful, they can be labeled by various fluorophores. So we know what we are looking at is exactly what we labeled. But the issue there is that we can only image those neurons or those cells when they're outside of the living tissue, meaning that we only image them when they are transparent. So the issue there when we want to image the cells within the living tissue is that the tissue itself, for example, the brain here, is naturally opaque. So we cannot even, uh, even penetrate by our naked eye to see through the brain or our skin. So the solutions in optical commun uh, community is really to design a better excitation scheme to avoid the way we visualize the 
the, the cells within the tissue. So here I introduce you a, a scheme, it's what we call multi-photon excitation. So compared to one photon excitation, where we have only one photon to excite one four or four photons, what we did is we used two photons or three photons simultaneously in order to create a nonlinear response of this points back function. So that what you see on the right hand side is that this points back function become highly localized. So that we create an optically confined uh, volume that allows us to reject all the out, out of focus uh, background. And on top of that, we can reliably image within the brain when the animal is still alive to visualize how each neuron is firing that's reactive to the, uh, the electrical activity within the brain that can be optically probed by the microscope. And what's more, we can use the visual stimuli to let the animals look at the uh, stimul uh, stimuli, uh, such as the video shown here, to understand how the neurons individually respond to these external stimuli. And this helps neuroscientists to understand how the visual encoding performs within the living animals. However, if you go to the real visual cortex of this uh, within the brain, you will realize that there's a hierarchical architecture that layers by different depths, that only imaging 2D is really not enough, and understanding one single neuron in a 2D scheme is not enough to understand how the brain computes at a 3D architecture that's existed in the brain. So the issue there with this current existing technology is that it's a very tedious method in order to visualize a 3D volume. The way to go is that you first form a very tightly focused beam, like what I show you here, which is what we call a Gaussian focus, and you scan this beam in 3D to sample the voxels in the 3D volume so that you form a 3D volume. And with this volume about the size covering all the visual cortex, this is about a few hours of data acquisition. And we need order of magnitude improvement to speed up in that data acquisition in order to be able to visualize how the neurons respond in real time in the 3D architecture. So to solve the issue from the perspective of optical engineer is that we can engineer the beam to be elongated in axial direction so that we can cover all the depths we want. And that can be formed by programming the light uh, with, a, uh, with a, what we call the spatial light modulator or a lens called uh, axicom. So the magic of that design is that we can elongate the axial profile of the beam so that it can form an elongated beam that by scanning this beam along only 2D, we're able to sample all the information in the 3D volume uh, with a frame rate of 2D data acquisition. So this method has been very successful when we want to speed up the data acquisition from the Gaussian beam scanning, where we acquire data with 16 frames with axial scan. And with the Bessel beam, we can, we can now only go to you know, t uh, about 10 to 30 times if, uh, improvement in the speed in order to get, get the same uh, amount of structural information here. What you can see is the basal beam has the identical Gaussian beam um, image quality and image uh, and information in the images. However, if you take a closer look at those images, you will find out is that there is a loss of the depth information in between the images. Where in the Gaussian beam, because we scan axially, so we can recover very easily the depth information, the depth map of the neurons. We know exactly where each individual neurons are coming from, which depth. However, with the Gaussian beam scan, we lose this information. And we only know there are three neurons, but we don't know where they are, because the beam itself just, uh, it just covered them simultaneously without knowing their information of depth. So I started to ask this question, you know, since this information is all there, can we just figure out a way to extract the depth information from the, uh, from the basal beam scan? And I started to ask my collaborator, uh, Yu Ying. 
She was trained as an optics uh, in background, and now she's working in the computer vision uh, community. So she knows what exactly I'm talking about when I describe him this basal beam issue. And she was saying that, well, this is a not a, a real um, existed problem in computer vision because uh, there's no such a way of data uh, of collecting the data from the 2D uh, images as we did in the basal beam scan. Because what we are comfortable with in computer vision community is that we try to get 3D information by projecting from multiple angles uh, that's commonly seen in the CT scan or in the uh, multi-view uh, 3D thing reconstruction. However, in our case, we only have one angle collecting the data and try to multiplex the depth. So we got this inspiration really from the computer vision community where the nerve is designed to reconstruct 3D real images. And in the same time, uh, the data information within the images can be further improved by incorporating some diffusion model uh, inf design. So this is our initial inspiration of our uh, solution to tackle this problem. And to be more specific, what we did at the beginning is to train an uh, implicit neural representation model, which is to learn uh, from a continuous 3D volume that's within the brain, to learn how this 3D continuous vo volume gets projected into a 2D space, a uh, discrete space. And we trained this model only use one data set we acquired, and we did not label specifically what's more than that. Uh, we, we used the information uh, only from the acquired data in order to try to figure out what's the best 3D uh, volume uh, we can learn from that uh, limited data set. And on top of that, we use that information of this INR to guide a diffusion model where we try to let the model learn the process and generate images and train by itself uh, to, to, uh, to generate images that's reliably uh, mimicking and, uh, in this uh, data generation process in our real acquisition. Otherwise, the diffusion model can go wild. And what's interestingly is that we can also generate a lot of different synthetic data set by uh, designing different profile of the basal beam. For example, we can design how much thicker the, the basal beam can compare to the Gaussian beam. For example, we can vary the, uh, the basal beam by n times of the Gaussian beam so that we can scan sequentially at various depths to form various 2D projections. And by doing that, we're, we're actually synthetically generating a lot of based on being a data set at different parameters. That really allows us to do this ablation study to see how well our model performs. For example, at the, at the beginning, when we have four times to eight times uh, faster data acquisition, meaning that we have four times to eight times longer beam compared to Gaussian beam, we have very reliable uh, reconstruction uh, data that if you compare with the ground truth, that is the Gaussian beam data, they look pretty much identical. However, if we go to higher depths, uh, where, where we go to, uh, meaning that we have more ambitious goal to speed up the data acquisition with the elong more elongated Gaussian uh, basal beam, we fail to reconstruct uh, very reliable data. But by doing so, I'm pretty hopeful that we are able to define the regimes that are comfortably using our model to predict and to reconstruct information from our data set. So within that regime, we're able to quantify uh, our performances across a different data set uh, we collected experimentally. And one thing about this work is that since it's completely new scientific questions for computer vision community, there's no benchmark. So what we are comparing with is a different uh, benchmark we uh, designed ourselves. And we can see that only with this combination of INR guided diffusion model, we can reliably reconstruct images uh, across different data sets at different uh, sparsity level. And here I show you more specific examples. For example, here is a 3D vasculature within the brain. And this is a Gaussian beam scan. And with this basal beam scan, uh, we can go eight times faster and we can reconstruct the depth information to reconstruct the 3D volumes. 
And in the same way, we're able to reconstruct the depth information, such as the depth map shown here. And on top of that, what's interesting finding for us is that if we go to more sparse sample, for example, this is a neuron, uh, more sparsely labeled, and we can go to about 16 times faster uh, in the data acquisition, and we can uh, reconstruct the images with high fidelity. So to summarize my talk so far, uh, what we have done is to design a method that try to tackle the problem where conventionally with 3D laser scanning microscope, we have to trade off the speed and uh, the information in, of depth. However, if we design a better microscope with a better uh, optical data acquisition scheme, we have to sacrifice the depth information uh, with the speed. What we try to do is design a method where in order to extract the depth information with the optical uh, design, we are able to uh, balance between the speed and the depth information so that we can not only speed up the decalculation, but also in the same time extract information of the depth. So some interesting future directions where uh, I'm working a kind of a dangerous regime AI for science where we try to uh, really design methods that's reliable for scientific research so that I see it's really necessary to study more uh, seriously how to quantify the uncertainty uh, within our data reconstruction so that can provide a biologist a better uh, understanding of their post-processing of the data to interpret any biological insight. And also, it's very interesting to, to see how we can go beyond this uh, one order of magnitude improvement in speed to more ambitious uh, speed up where I was hoping to go to uh, about two to three orders faster in speed. And moreover, since the design of this basal beam is really uh, inspired by the optical, uh, conventional optical community, uh, I see there's a lot of room where we can join design, how we can, uh, how we can design this 3D uh, excitation in, uh, field together with our reconstruction method so that we can optimize both the speed and information of the depth extraction, uh, within the depth extraction. And what's more exciting to me uh, on top of this future direction is that I see a lot of interesting application where uh, I believe a joint effort between the, uh, the CV community and biological community and the uh, optical microscopy community can work together. The first one is to really quantify the uncertainty where we can provide a more reliable AI tool for our biomedical uh, research where microscopy is often used daily tool and, and there's a still a huge demand to push forward the boundary of optical microscopy. And the second one is to improve the reconstruction uh, to faster speed so that we can really visualize in real time this whole vort uh, cortex response at the single cell level uh, uh, towards the external stimuli. And the third one is really the how, to, how can we design a smarter microscope uh, com by combining this programmable device with our algorithm. And with that, I want to thank my collaborators, uh, Professor Yuin Zhou at UC St. Cruz, and we're hoping to tackle more of the future direction in the future. Um, and also I want to thank my lab members at ENF in Paris, where um, we are a pretty happy lab and with a lot of exciting work going on and uh, our funding agencies, uh, Optica Foundation, Chen Zuckerberg and Google and TPU, uh, that's for Yuin's project. And lastly, I want to uh, do some self-promotion uh, where we're hiring at UC Irvine. We, uh, we have a nice view of the three of the four famous beaches uh, in the South California uh, with, within 30 minutes walk, uh, five minutes drive. And we're affiliated, uh, gonna be affiliated with electrical engineering and computer science department. Uh, and we'll be cl uh, collaborate extensively with Beckman Laser Institute and medical clinics where I hope to combine the optics and computation and biomedicine to drive the next generation optical design for biological discovery and medical applications. With that, I want to thank you for your attention and feel free to take images of these slides to share with your friends or students.
Andreas for finishing ahead of time. Uh, any questions? Hi, uh, so I have a question. Um, you want to uh, sense a certain volume at the same time that in your raw data. And you decided to use Bessel beams in order to capture a certain depth range at the same time. But you could also have done it, and I think it would have been easier to do it uh, horizontally rather than vertically. I mean, you can, of course, create a, right. you can of course create a point spread function that is horizontal yep. rather, than, rather than vertical. And, and vertically, you have changes of the width. Although it's a Bessel beam, it's changing with the depth. But if you do it horizontally, you can be much more accurate. Right, that, that's a very good point. You're actually inventing a new microscope that's called light sheet microscopy, where uh, if you want to scan the beam, uh, lab horizontally, the, uh, the issue there is that it's harder to do that uh, in vivo where the animal uh, only have you know, uh, limited access. For example, if you want to image the brain, uh, it's hard to let the beam go to this, uh, this direction. It's easier to go uh, vertically. Yeah, Th that's no, the no, motivation no, 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 of no, that, that design. That's what I meant. I meant you can focus on a line. Instead of having a focus on a spot, mm -hmm. you can focus on a line rather than a spot. And, and, and that would be a line that would integrate, that would integrate uh, the emission or excite emission and, and integrate the emission on, on a line rather than on a, on a horizontal line rather than a vertical line. That's kind of. Uh, you are talking about the detection, right? Or I'm saying the scan, you're, you're doing scanning in 3D in any case. Uh -huh. but your point spread function is, is a vertical segment. Yes. It could have been a horizontal line segment as well. What, what is the advantage of It's a needle in the horizontal, right? Yes. Right, so in that case, you have to scan, uh, you yes. have to generate the beam horizontally yes. and let it go into a sample. Yes. So the sample is, uh, well, in the living case, it's easier to, uh, it's, as I mentioned, it's easier to uh, make sure the property is more or less homogeneous when it's vertically inserted compared to horizontal because Horizontally is uh, still, uh, let's list the brain as an example. So if you let the beam goes into uh, the brain horizontally, you hit something like a scalp first, unless you expose everything uh, uh, along the beam propagation direction. It, 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 imagine you only drill a small hole and the beam can easily go in, but it's very hard to let the beam go this direction. That's like a bullet goes into the scalp. That's, uh, it's, it's harder. But it's, it is possible if you want to do this uh, with the uh, tissues that are fully exposed. For example, people are designing uh, the organoid to replace the live, live animals. In that case, the sample itself is fully exposed. You can let the beam go that, that direction, which is completely OK, as you mentioned. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, uh, really nice work. One question regarding the diffusion-based reconstruction. So usually with diffusion-based, you also have a lot of hallucination, which you probably don't want in your 3D reconstruction. Are there any constraints that you're putting on your, uh, in your loss or something that- Yeah, in, in our, yes, uh, that's a good point. So in our loss function, we try to incorporate the condition uh, from the INR, uh, so that uh, it's a trade-off between the uh, INR prior uh, with this uh, pretty naive non-conditional case. So we, we tune that parameters to balance those uh, prior and uh, non-prior scenarios. Thanks. Hi, I was wondering if uh, there are any like deconvolution-based techniques because if you know the point spread function along depth, can you just like some do some kind of deconvolution? and uh, basically obtain something, like did you compare it to something like that? I don't even know if it, something like that exists. Right, uh, that's a pretty fair point. I, I, I know it's easy to do t-convolution in, uh, in the lateral di direction where in 2D. Uh, in 3D, if you want to uh, deconvolute a really a crazy elongated beam, um, I personally didn't try it, but I, I find it very challenging because um, the, yeah, that's my first intuition. Okay, no question. We have time for one last question. No more questions.
questions, so let's thank our speaker again. Thanks. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm Su Yuan Shen from Shanghai Tech University, and I'm, I'm here to present our recent work, Holy123, Transient Enhanced Holistic Imaging to 3D Generation. As a huge Pokemon fan, I want to start today's presentation with a little story. There is once a Pikachu named Holy, and while playing with us human friends, Holy ran off the road and into the woods. When we finally found Holy, she actually grouped with her fellow Pikachus, and they all looked the same from the front view. So if you are a Pokemon fan, just like me, you will know that Pikachus differ not by their faces, but by the shapes of their tails. The different shapes of their tails show their unique personality and even abilities. But how can we tell which one was our holy? Luckily, this all happens at ICCP conference in Lausanne where we have a group of imaging experts. For example, we can use line-of-sight imaging, we can capture high-quality and even 3D front view of a holy. And we can also use non-line-of-sight imaging, we can ca capture low-quality, low-resolution imaging of the tear. However, none of these two imaging modalities used alone is sufficient to identify holy. But putting them all together via a generative technique, as I will propose, we can accomplish this task. So in this paper, we present a holistic imaging method that we call HOLY123 for holistic 3D re recovery from a single viewpoint input by combining live-of-sight imaging and non-live-of-sight imaging. What has motivated us to design this technique is the rapid revolution in 3D shape representations. Today, shapes are no longer point cloud or no longer depth maps they can be implicit representations, such as NERF, or they can be geometry proxies, such as 3D Gaussians. The goal also switches from restructuring to high-quality generation. For example, on the NERF setting, one can capture imaging or depth map of an object from multiple perspectives. And then we can use a neural network to recover a volumetric representation and convert it to a mesh. 3D Gaussians focus on rendering by replacing the neural network with Gaussian spheres. However, these two methods assume that the object is holistically visible, but in reality, a large portion of an object can be substantially invisible. Of course, conceptually, the invisible part can be generated. In fact, a various 3D representations have led to corresponding generation techniques ranging from dream fusion to large recurrent dream models and to native 3D generation models, such as the recent CBRAF work, Clay. We believe that generation starts to serve as a new form of reconstruction. But there is a key problem remained unresolved, which is the ambiguity of the hidden part. Notice that the same front view of an object may have many possi possibilities on the hidden geometry, all of which made sense, just like the Pikachu in our story. To address this problem, we resort to use non live site imaging, or we call NLOS imaging. A common NLOS setup uses a pulse laser to eliminate a relay wall. A single photon detector then captures the light that bounces back from the hidden object. By standing over the relay surface, we can gather measures of NLOS transients for retrieving the hidden side. In NLOS re reconstruction, this inverse problem is commonly cast as a deconvolution problem. However, this problem is highly ill-posed, 
and the return judging quality by far is still way below line of sight imaging. In fact, to get even reasonable return judging results, traditional methods require ultra-dense sampling on the relay surface. Sparse scanning may produce meaningless reconstructions. So instead of reconstruction, we cast the problem at generation, where we impose unlost transients at controls in 3D generation. System-wise, our Holy 123 integrates a SPAT system and a camera. For the visible part, the camera captures the RGB imaging, and the SPAT system, just like a LiDAR system, can capture the depth map from the front view. For the unlost part, we can use the SPAT system to capture the unlost transients for, for further 3D generation. It is noteworthy that our unlost setting differs from the previous ones in that the front SPAT can only scan the points that are not occluded by the object itself. This leaves much fewer effective transient scans. And in conventional unlost imaging, such a setup usually generates very low quality reconstructions. However, we found that these, this setup are sufficient for our 3D generation. Now let's go to the training details of our pipeline. So given the input from the single view scan, we propose a neural RGPT field to unify loss and unloss measures. This neural field has one density channel for geometry, one unloss albedo channel, and three RGB channels for line of sight imaging. We then adopt volume rendering and transient rendering to produce front of view imaging, depth map, and unlost transient. These predictions are constrained by the captured measures, respectively. We also render normal view images and use 2D diffusion models as hybrid diffusion priors. We use a straw distillation loss, which is also called SDS loss, for the novel view, which incorporates a pre-trained 2D diffusion model as prior in optimization. We opti optimize the neural field with all three loss. A hyperparameter controls the weight of the transient loss. In this paper, we blend two diffusion models for the SDS loss, including the stable diffusion and a recreditioned diffusion model from 0, 1, 2, 3. So after training, we also introduce a refined stage to extract the mesh from the neural fields with enhanced geometry and texture details. Here we show the results of our method. First, we compare our Holy 123 to SOTA methods on synthetic dataset. This includes Wonder 3D and Magic 123. Holy 123 produces a complete and accurate 3D model of the object with geometry details such as the tails of Pikachu or the long state held by the ninja turtle in this case. We also want to point out that geometry-wise, Holy 123 employs transient priors to generate very high-quality geometry. However, texture-wise, Holy 123 still relies on the diffusion models for texture generation because the transient are always captured with a narrow band wavelength. As a result, the texture generation still has certain discontinuity you may find in this case. Such artifacts can be fixed by employing diffusion-based impacting. We also capture real data from our image system, including a RGB camera for frontal view RGB imaging, and a SPAT system for depth maps and unlost transients. And our SPAT system consists of a pause laser and a single pixel SPAT. We have experimented on a variety of objects which have different shapes and different materials. For example, the letter SD is paper and the dice is plastic. Our method successfully recovers the accurate shape, shape and appearance. Among all these cases, the most interesting one is the dice. We capture the front view of number six and the Holy 123 produce the correct bad face. However, only other pure generative models, which only relies on the diffusion prior, such as Magic 123, outputs a random number on the invisible, invisible side. We have additional discussions in our paper. Our method also has the potential to holistic imaging on the different setups. Here we render a castle with three surrounding walls. Holy 123 managed to fuse the transient from multiple walls as prior for generation. 
and the details of this test are also found in our paper. So to conclude our presentation, we hope that our work has showcased the possibility of combining time of flight sensor, RGB sensor, and generative AI for holistic 3D imaging. In fact, given that many smartphones nowadays are already equipped with time of flight sensor and RGB cameras, mobile holistic imaging may come to practical uses sooner than later. There are also many interesting applications for holistic imaging, ranging from autonomous driving to scanning structures in archaeological exploration and potentially to medical imaging, such as seeing behind the bones. And ultimately, with rapid advance in generative AI, it is foreseeable that an endless foundation model will soon emerge to support a series of different downstream tasks. And in the end, most importantly, we want to say that we believe imaging will still be the frontier and the foundation of AI. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention. We provide many more interesting results and technical details in our paper, and I'm, I'm happy here to answer your questions. is how to capture the data from the from object that is moving. I think I think the the best solution for this is to use a SPAD array instead of instead of the single pixel uh, SPAD. In fact in our in our setting the most uh, the most time time costly process in capturing data is to you need to scan the you need to scan the scene and to get the lost depth or the or the unlost transient, but if you if you can use a SPAD array to replace the single pixel SPAD, you can just just like take a photo, you can shot the scene and get all you want. Uh, I'm just wondering what, what's the resolution of your SPAD array, and does your method work if it's very low resolution? Uh, okay. Uh, I think your question is mainly about the resolution on the endless part, I guess. Uh, in, uh, in, in this paper setting, we use a single pixel spider, so we need to scan the scene and place the endless transient. And in this paper, we found a very interesting thing is that for most scenes, you only need to, uh, you only need to scan like 10 or 20 endless transient to get, to get the transient as, as prior to and feed to the generative model. So, the resolution of the uh, transient is not very practical in our in our in our in our generative techniques. Design that kind of Uh, I'm Hank uh, from the M MIT Media Lab uh, in the Camera Culture Group with Ramesh Rosker. And today yeah, I'll be talking about uh, mapping a specular surface uh, using a cons consumer grade flash LiDAR. So, yeah, uh, have you ever uh, run into a glass door? Or, well, specular object like mirror or glass um, can be confusing. Like, even humans, we cannot tell whether it's virtual or real uh, without cues such as uh, the frame of the mirror. And yeah, and you know, spectral objects are everywhere, like you see at the EPFL library, um, which can cause problems for many vision systems such as room scanning or uh, autonomous drone. And so inability to uh, detect these spectral objects uh, can be fatal, like the drone can crash into the window. 
So, so why are mirror uh, challenging or confusing? Um, if you just look at the image, it's hard to tell it's virtual or real. But if you zoom out, you can probably detect it from the context. But mirror is also uh, confusing for LiDAR system. So in fact, uh, when LiDAR scans the mirror, um, the mirror appears to be uh, invisible as if there's a hole. So what uh, other technique used to deal with mirror? Like for RGB, one way is using spectral uh, flow. So spectral flow uh, might use cues such as reflection inside the mirror moving different direction from the background, but it requires dense correspondence. Um, other, um, yeah, other data-driven approach um, <coughs> uh, might use cues like the frame, but it might be fails in ambiguous case such as the doorway. Um, but in our work, um, we leverage a flash LiDAR uh, on a handheld device um, to detect spectral surface. So <clears throat> for convenient LiDAR, um, because it only measures the time of flight from a single direction, uh, this works for diffuse surface where the light would bounce back directly. Uh, but for spectral surface, um, the light will bounce off in, into another direction. And so therefore, um, it's actually very important to model the multi-bounce uh, for uh, modeling the spectral surface. Um, in, in this work, uh, we will model one, two, or three bounce return. So the type of return can be uh, divided by illuminating diffuse surface first or spectral surface first. For diffuse surface, um, <clears throat> you can model uh, one bounce or you can model uh, one or two bounce return. If you illuminate the spectral surface first, uh, you can model uh, one, two bounce or um, one, two, and three bounce returns. Yeah, um, so why couldn't the LiDAR system detect mirror? So for con conventional LiDAR, because you only receive light from the same direction as its transmitter, uh, when there's a spectral surface, um, yeah, you won't know there's a actual multi-bounce happening. But most, but most LiDAR system um, incorrectly treats all measurement as one bounce return. So it, it thinks um, yeah, the mirror is actually farther than it actually is, and there's a hole. So yeah, so there's, there'll be, it thinks the mirror has a hole and an artifact of uh, reflection behind the mirror. Um, yeah, so, but what if, um, if the receiver can detect um, from different direction from transmitter? Um, yeah, if it, if you can detect from different direction, then you can actually detect a two bounce return. And what this tells you is that if there's a two bounce return, uh, it, presence, then you know that there must be a presence of spectral surface. If there's no two bounce return, um, there's no spectral surface. Um, so the ideal setup is that if you have a dense receiver, we can detect uh, returns from a different direction. Um, but in, in the case of ideal setup of dense receiver, um, if you add a challenge of multiplexing, meaning that if all light emits at the same time, um, it actually becomes uh, much more difficult because you actually don't know um, yeah, which, which uh, diffuse point here uh, match with which spectral points from the mirror. And so this brings us to the challenge with consumer grade LiDAR, which is the setup of our LiDAR device. One cha first challenge is the multiplexing, as I, I talked about. And then um, the second challenge is actually our device, the, we have collated transmitter and receiver. And this, yeah. So the first challenge, multiplexing, yeah, it's it's hard to match which diffusion point with the spectral points. So what we do is we only look at the diffuse and spectral point that are risco pairs, and we introduce the first constraint. So what, what's the risco pair pixel? So risco pair pixel are a pair um, of pixel um, that actually share the same light path, but like in opposite direction. And this is true by the Helmholtz principle. Um, so just looking uh, along this path, we know this diffuse point must match with this spectral point. And so once you have the time of flight of this path, you can tri triangulate and to, to get the tr distance to the true mirror surface. And so that's the, our first constraint, the result, uh, we call the peak match, where the, the two bounds of the result pair um, should match with each other. So the second challenge is co uh, in our, our sensor has collated transmitter and receiver. And this means that the number of uh, receiving pixels is the same as the emitting beams. And so that uh, this also means that the receiving direction um, only occurs along the emitting direction at the coinciding spot. 
And so in our device, there is no measurement at the non-coalescing spot. Um, so at the coalescing spot, um, because each pixel in our device can, can detect two echoes. So we, 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 we can only know one of the two echoes. The two echoes can either be one bounce, two bounce, or two bounce, or three bounce. And in order to solve this uh, ambiguity, um, we, we introduced a second constraint. So our second constraint, or the pseudo pair constraint, is called the path diff match. Um, so from the diffuse surface direction, um, you can detect two bounds. And if you, if you subtract it, the one bounce return from this uh, di direction, um, you get this remaining path. And for the uh, signal coming from the spectral surface direction, you can, you can either get three bounds, and if you subtract the two bounds uh, return, uh, you get this remaining path. And as you can see, the, the difference of the path are actually equal. So yeah, so we, ca we call this path diff match. So, so combining both constraint, uh, you, you can try the visible pair constraint where um, one, one of the echo must match in, t in the time of flight and the difference of the time of flight must also match. Yeah. And once you um, compute a comp uh, visible pair constraint, you can, you can identify which one is one bounce, two bounce, and three bounce. And from there, you can compute the distance to the diffuse surface and the distance to the uh, spectral surface. And yeah, just on a note, um, previous work um, from, um, from Henry, uh, he used a dense receiver. So, um, <clears throat> and, and, and then he assumed that uh, from the, so dense receiver can detect and response from every position. So he, uh, on, to simplify, he only detect uh, one bounce and three bounce from coincending spot, and he ignored the two bounce, and he assumed all the two bounce are from the non coincending spot, and this is actually, and the reason that to do that is this, this is much easier. But in our device, because we have a sparse receiver, we can only detect signal from the coalescing spot. So our contribution is really to classify um, one bounce, two bounce, three bounce from the coalescing spot. And here's, uh, and we show that our 3D reconstruction resolve with our method. Um, and because our LiDAR sensor is very sparse, it only has 12 times 12 resolution. So we use RGB to compute the scene points uh, using structure from motion. Yeah. Uh, and then with the LiDAR points, we run our risk algorithms. Uh, we only detect very few points, like up to three points per frame. So we accumulate points over multiple frames. And because in, in this case, we have floor and a ceiling, so we're able to detect points uh, on the bottom and near the ceiling. And then finally, we, we, we just do a mesh reconstruction of the three points to get much denser surface reconstruction. This also helps to filter out like, actually noisy detection. And so because we know the true surface location, we, are, we can actually uh, curl away the incorrect reflection uh, behind the mirror. That, yeah. And yeah, finally, uh, I show some diff different result where we, we can use a, the left side wall of, of the left of the mirror on, on a sink uh, scenario to detect, to de detect the mirror. Or we also uh, show in, in a detecting a bottom side of a big mirror in a room. Um, and, and our method also can also enhance segmentation. So for, for like RGB data driven based method, um, you sometimes get confused like which is the mirror, like based on the cues of the frame. Um, but our LiDAR approach can, can detect the true mirror, uh, but, it's, it's, um, but it's much more smart. So if you combine both techniques, you can detect a true and very dense mirror surface. Um, our method also works for glass. So in, in C, um, there's actually real glass in both our method and like a RGB data driven method can detect it both as glass. But in, in here, the, there's, a, there's actually no glass here, it's just an empty frame. Um, and the data driven was like uh, confused and detect as a glass due to the frame, but our method is phys physically based so we can, we can reject this. And finally, we'll show that our method also can enhance novel view synthesis. Um, for many nerve that uh, render mirror that it uses a mirror mask as input. So if the mirror mask from RGB method incorrectly detect the mirror mask, the rendering result will be uh, worse. By using our method, we, we can get a, a corrected mirror mask as input to the nerve. And so the result is like much clearer as you see here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for limitation, yeah, our method definitely has false, false positive 
and, and usually it happens uh, when there's like more than three bounces uh, from nearby objects. Like here, the sofa gives some fossils and there's a mirror. And our detection is very sparse from the low resolution sensor. So in future direction, like we like to use like sensor fusion from RGB to make the detection more dense and data driven priors to remove false positives. And maybe another direction is like if on the hardware side, if there's introduce of a higher resolution hardware on consumer device, that'll be, that definitely helps. Um, yeah, and yeah, thank you for listening and there's more detail for the work. Hi, I have a question. Um, so because your uh, scanning and your detection is sparse, uh, does the angle between the specular and the diffuse surface matter? Uh, like yeah. Does it have to be, you know, like if it's not in 90 degrees and you might miss the returning bounce? Like uh, yeah. yeah, the scanning angle, uh, yeah, you need to have like a, a one visible diffuse surface and one visible uh, specular surface. So the angles uh, best usually at a 45 angle when you can look at both, but, uh, but you can definitely move around, um, try, to try to detect like, the bottom side of the mirror or different side of the mirror. Um, yeah. And then, the, yeah, the angle depends on, like, it has to form the risk pair, so angle does matter. Yes. And the second question is, what kind of range does this method best work at? Because the, uh -huh. it's a consumer grade device, so it's low power. Yeah. Um, like, is there a range where it's optimal? Yeah, uh, yeah it depends on the sensor, but our, for our device, yeah, the range works roughly very well, like around three feet or one meter, like okay. plus or minus. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, thank you Shu, for the introduction. I'm Jin Wei, assistant professor at George Mason University. Um, I'll be presenting our work on textualist deformable object tracking with inv invisible markers. And this is a joint work with Jensen Pixel Lab, White Thought, and Columbia University. Um, so tracking an object with little or even no texture is very hard since they don't have many features that we can make use of. And here I want to illustrate this using this example where two persons are walking. One of them is wearing a sweater with uh, rich texture, this guy here, I'm not sure you can see my pointer. And the other one is wearing a solid color jacket that has very little texture. So if I place a point on this textured sweater and then run a commercial tracker, this um, point will be tracked very robustly as we expect. But if I do the same thing on this solid color jacket, the tracker uh, will lose track very easily and you can see this tracker point uh, jumping around. So basically from this example, I want to show you that tracking with very little texture is very challenging and um, this problem cannot be, very, um, cannot be solved very well even with state-of-the-art trackers. So in this work, we present a solution that uses invisible markers for tracking and reconstructing deformable objects, especially with very little textures. For example, um, this um, white plus as a very extreme case. So the idea is very simple. We draw UV fluorescent patterns on object, and in this way, we can add features to um, their appearance. And here you can see some example patterns that we draw on different types of object. Then these features that we add are only visible under UV light. We call them the invisible markers. And by doing this, you can track features um, and find correspondences with this uh, UV fluorescent markers and then map them back to the original appearance. And with that, we collect the data set with ground truth tracked correspondences and also 3D models. So going back to our invisible marker, let's quickly look at what is UV fluorescent. You probably have already seen this in the first invited talk. I'm just going uh, to give you a, another brief uh, review of it. So UV fluorescent is the phenomenon that a substance absorbs UV light but give out longer wavelengths in the uh, visible spectrum. What happens here is that when 
a high energy UV photon enters the substance that is fluorescent, um, the photon will be absorbed and raise the substance molecule to a very high energy level. And then this molecule will then relax um, a little bit and go down to the ground state and then this, in this process, a lower energy photon will be released. And this gives us the visible light that we see. And that is why UV fluorescent is only visible when illuminated with UV light. Fluorescent phenomena of very common nature, which gives us the inspiration for this work. Many animals, plants, and minerals are fluorescent. Their colors and appearance change when illuminated with UV lights. And here are some more examples of amazing, amazing species that are either fluorescent or bioluminescent. So essentially, fluorescent gives an object the benefit of having two sets of appearances. One is under normal lighting or visible light, and the other is under UV light. And this two set of appearances could be used in a complementary way without um, interfering each other. But since we're dealing with the form of motion here, a big challenge we have is to synchronize the acquisition of both set of appearance um, since they're in motion. And because they need to use different set of lighting modes, this makes the synchronized video acquisition very hard. So uh, what we did to address this challenge here is to blink the UV light in a very short time interval, say a few milliseconds. And we used two set of cameras um, for taking pictures or recording videos. So one of them is synchronized with the UV light, so it captures the fluorescent appearance. And the other one is triggered right after the UV light turns off, and in this way, it captures the original appearance without markers under the normal lighting. And since the UV light flashes very fast, the time delay between the two sets of um, videos is very small and can be ignored if the motion is not too big. So following this scheme, we spilled up the scaled system with many cameras and lights. The cameras are wired into two groups. And again, one group sync with the UV lights, we call them UV views, and the other is triggered with light delay when UV lights are off, and we call them normal views. And here is a zooming view of the UV light board that we use. And each board integrates uh, three UV LEDs that give out light in the UVA spectrum, which is the safest UV spectrum to humans since it's abundant in the sunlight. And with that, we're able to record to the two appearances of uh, deformable objects, like this hands here, and it, um, um, when they're in motion in an almost a synchronized way. And since we have many cameras in the system, we capture both the fluorescent views and normal views from different angles. We then organize these images into two groups. Fluorescent images with the markers, which are good for tracking and reconstruction, and the normal view images that maintain the object's original appearance without markers <coughs> being seen. So we first recovered the 3D point cloud using the fluorescent images because they're full of features. And for each frame, we align the 3D, uh, 3D point cloud to a known template. And for between neighboring frames, we use fluorescent features for tracking. And finally, we mapped the 3D model and tracked the feature points to the normal view images, from which the deformable objects may be very hard to track or reconstruct, since um, their original appearance may have very little textures. So because our reconstruction is template-based, here I want to talk more about the 3D template we use. So our templates are predefined based on the type of objects. And in our work, we mainly deal with four type of ob uh, types of objects that are rope, um, paper and cloth, and hands. For rope, since it's a 1D object, uh, we use a, um, 1D, a set of 1D joints as our, as our template. And these joints are directly derived from the markers. For paper and cloth, we use 2D line grids as template, and the density of these grids is determined by the pattern that we use. For hand scenes, because they're more complicated in geometry, we use a data-driven model called MANO as template for deformation. So once we have the point cloud and uh, non-rigid uh, and, and template, and we apply non-rigid registration to align the recovered point cloud to their template. And this is done by solving an optimization problem with this uh, objective function. 
uh, we have a fitting term here that minimized the point-wise distance between the point cloud and the deformed uh, template mesh. And then we have a smooth term that regulates the smoothness of template's deformation, and these two terms are pretty standard in um, non-rigid restoration algorithms. Since in our data, we also have correspondences introduced by fluorescent markers, we use this marker term to minimize the distance between um, the markers detected in images and their positions uh, that are projected onto the template mesh. Take Hansing, for example, because they're uh, the most complex case here. We first project this uh, features using a rest pose and then transform them along with the template. And along with this optimization, we're able to deform template to make it match to a point cloud. And next, I want to discuss a little bit about our um, delay in the time domain. Since our fluorescent views and normal view videos are not perfectly synchronized, um, they're triggered with a few milliseconds delay. Here I want to show you some experiments that we did on evaluating this influence. So um, here we consider features that are visible under both views, say so these four um, corner points here. Uh, we first project them into 3D using camera parameters and multiple view images. And then we calculate the distance between these two 3D points, and this is the error caused by the delay um, between these two types of um, uh, videos. Although this uh, spatial shift is not too much, we still use interpolation to make it even smaller. What, it, what we did here is to take a neighboring frame of the fluorescent view, and then we linearly interpolate an intermediate 3D <coughs> point, since we know the amount of time difference between um, the set of images. And by doing this, the spatial error is further reduced. And notice that this error is not reduced to zero because the actual motion may not be linear. And here are some quantitative evaluations that we have done. And here the axis is the intermediate time that we use for the interpolation, and when the right amount is used, the distance error will be minimal. And these are two examples for a uh, different amount of delay that we use for capturing uh, the normal view and the uh, fluorescent views. And in both cases, the minimal distance is under three, uh, 0 0.3 millimeters, which is um, small enough number to discard comparing to the size of object. So from this uh, evaluation, we can see that our tracked features when being mapped from fluorescent views to normal views, they're quite reliable and can be considered as ground truths. And with that, with the imaging system and this um, um, mapping algorithm, we captured deformable motions of four types of objects um, that are row, um, paper, cloth, and hands, and form a data set for deformable object tracking. Altogether, we have over one million video frames in our data set, and our data set is now available on our project website, which I'll share with you at the end of my presentation. So here's a video that shows some examples in our data set. So we provide both the fluorescent view and the normal view uh, videos, uh, tracked features, and also 3D model of the object in motion. And for the paper theme, we have uh, paper with various kind of textures and features are first tracked on uh, fluorescent view and then um, mapped to uh, the normal view. And the 3D template is also aligned to the normal view as well. For cloth themes, we use um, purely white silver cloths and this is very challenging because it doesn't have any feature at all, but with fluorescent markers, we can do a pretty good job on um, tracking and reconstruction. And for hand scenes, we have a variety of motions um, that involve one hand, uh, two hands, and also uh, interaction of hands with um, another object. So with our data set, uh, we can benchmark deformable tracking and reconstruction algorithms since we have ground truths to compare with. And here are some results on evaluating hand reconstruction algorithms. We can see um, <coughs> this algorithm, they work quite well on one hand scenes, but um, their performance may not be very stable on two hands or hand object interaction scenes that have large occlusions. 
Our data set can also be used for training supervised to learning algorithms and improve their performance on handling things with very little textures. And here are some flow estimation results that run on one of our paper scene. We use state of the art uh, rough algorithm for that. Um, and you can see that after fine tuning with our data set, the flow estimation is more accurate and safer. And here's another result on data from another real data set, which is called Desert. Um, it is a very popular data set on deformable object, and these data are not used in training. And we can see that also with a fine-tuned model, um, the performance greatly improved. We also did an uh, experiment on template alignment, uh, which um, aligns a given 3D template to 2D image based on detected features. We test with one of the state-of-the-art algorithm called um, Robust. And you can see that it struggles on this theme since the detected features are too sparse. And again, after fine tuning with um, our data set, it is able to find enough features and fit the template very well. So in summary, I've shown you our work that uses uh, UV fluorescent markers for tracking and reconstructing deformable objects with little texture. We have developed an imaging system for capturing both the fluorescent appearance and normal appearance in a almost synchronized fashion and we collect a large data set for deep formal object tracking and reconstruction with scrum choose labels like correspondences and 3D models, and our data set is good for benchmarking and can be used for uh, training supervised algorithm to improve their performance, especially on challenging textual um, scenarios. That's all for my presentation. Thank you for listening. And here is the website of um, our project where you can find our data set, and now I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Very nice. So compared to other techniques like, you know, infrared and something like that, what is the one big advantage for using the, the um, UV fluorescent trackers? Uh, so um, um, especially comparing to like a thermal or infrared, uh, one big advantage of UV fluorescent is, uh, is that we don't need to use the different type of sensors because the, um, 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 the, the light of uh, give out from UV fluorescent is still under the visible spectrum. So we only use the visible cameras for doing everything. So that's one of the biggest uh, advantage. And also, um, it's easy for us to apply this kind of like a uh, UV uh, pigment onto different types of objects. We have a variety of that. Yeah. Uh, I want to uh, further ask about her question, basically. Uh, you know, Kinect, it's using near infrared, it's not the thermal infrared. It uses an ordinary camera. Ordinary camera will, will see near infrared. And that's also invisible, and it doesn't harm anybody, I think. Uh, and, uh, but UV, I would be concerned, frankly, uh, especially because uh, fluorescence has a very uh, low uh, efficiency. So if you want to project in daylight outside, you will need high power. And eventually, I don't think that's going to be um, you know, I don't think there will be, uh, th I, th I think there will be regulatory issues. So given the regulatory issues, given the fact that there is a, there, are, uh, there is an alternative in the near infrared, what is really the motivation to use uh, this? Right, that's a good question. So uh, if you're com comparing about our approach versus Kinect, so one fundamental uh, difference is that um, Kinect is based on projection versus we directly apply this pattern onto the surface. So our markers are cut to surface because we draw on them. And uh, if you think about um, the, um, the object we're handling, uh, we're dealing with, the deformable object, you can actually not use Kinect for that because the surfaces are deforming and you cannot use projection-based methods. So that's one of the fundamental uh, difference uh, between our approach and this kind of projection base. And uh, uh, going back to infrared uh, or thermal uh, you know, um, markers, one big challenge is how you can um, you know, uh, apply these markers that are attached to surface. So this is one of the big challenge. I know uh, Mark has a 3D chart paper that used the laser to uh, you know, kind of like a, um, attach the thermal spots onto the object, but this is kind of like a um, um, uh, this is one of the possible way, but uh, in our approach, we directly use pigment or uh, a UV fluorescent paint 
to draw uh, markers directly onto the surface with um, like uh, textures that are attached to the surface. So I think that's uh, the reason why we decide to use the UV fluorescence. Yeah. So hi everyone, uh, I'm Nimrod from Tel Aviv University and I'll be presenting uh, Deep Phase Coded Image Fire. Uh, this is done in collaboration with Eli Schwartz and Professor Rajagiris. And I also like to thank uh, Shail Malem, which was a PhD in our lab that uh, actually developed uh, this imaging system which laid the foundation, uh, some of the foundation for this work. Uh, so I'll begin with a little bit of motivation. Usually when we have uh, phase-coded uh, uh, imaging and we want to uh, uh, try to solve some vision task, we'll probably use a supervised training scheme when we have the blur images as input and uh, we have the supervision ground truth, for example, uh, depth maps. And, but for that, you need data sets. And, and usually data sets in this area are, uh, need to be high quality, which means they are hard to collect. Uh, sometimes you overcome this by using synthetic data since uh, you can uh, simulate everything and everything is much more comfortable. And even if you have some uh, real world data sets, they're usually uh, um, limited or uh, at least there are not many. Uh, so our main motivation was uh, can we build uh, and push this further away and build a zero shot method uh, for face coded imaging and remove the necessity of, for a data set. Um, so before I'll dive into the approach, I'll just briefly show our um, imaging system. So as you see, this is our face-coded uh, uh, mask. It's designed to manipulate the PSF in such way that uh, uh, um, we'll manipulate the color and the depth, meaning for each RGB sensor, uh, we'll have, at each depth, we'll have uh, uh, some channels that will be in focus and some are not. Those cues will help us to uh, uh, solve depth estimation and reconstruct the all-in-focus image. Here is an example uh, uh, of the imaging system. You can see it's, it's blur, uh, uh, it's not sharp uh, anywhere because at each pair, uh, compared to a conventional system, all the colors are not in focus at one place. By the way, this is our uh, synthetic data sets called the agent data set, which was uh, the imaging system developed on. Contains roughly 500 images um, divided into five different scenes. I'll talk about it uh, in the results again. So before I dive into all the um, uh, big slides with all the details, I'll just do a high level approach first. So what we wanna do is we wanna take this, uh, um, actually some image generator that will generate us an image, which will output uh, intermediate uh, outputs, uh, which you can consider as the depth maps, for example. But how we will tell the generator how to create those depth maps? We'll need some differentiable forward process to guide it. And this differential for process will take, for example, the depth map and will reconstruct, let's say, the Blair uh, face coded image. And then we can apply some reconstruction loss and propagate the gradients uh, to improve the generator. So now with all the details, this is essentially DPCIP. Um, we have the image generator, which is based on deep image fire. It's essentially a unit with skip connections that can take uh, noise as input and um, actually generate uh, a pixel level depth map and an all-in-focus image. Uh, those outputs, intermediate outputs, will go to our differentiable forward process, which is the DCM, uh, which mimic the imaging system and it will create the phase-coded uh, uh, image at the end. And then, as I said, we can apply the reconstruction loss and propagate the gradients all the way to the generator. Uh, you can see that the generator actually uh, uh, trying uh, to achieve what we don't have, which is the real scene depth map and all in focus image and our uh, for process trying to mimic the face coded image. So I won't dive into the image generator because it's a well known and it's uh, uh, not really the focus. I'll focus on the uh, for process, which is the differentiable camera model. So what we have here, you can see uh, uh, on the right, it's the all-in-focus uh, image that the generator gave us, and also uh, from the bottom you can see the depth map. And uh, 
Recall that uh, uh, since we have uh, um, the imaging system, uh, we developed it. We have it. Uh, we have the PSF for each uh, for each of the depth. We can uh, actually select subset of them uh, um, and create uh, um, blur images with respect to those depths. Those are the IPs that you see here. And and the reason. Uh, um, and then we can go over to the depth map. And for each pixel, we can uh, uh, take the value and find the closest two uh, generated image planes. Um, with those two, we can later interpolate and create the final RGB value uh, to reconstruct the blur image. Uh, mathematically, it's done using this uh, uh, W, where for each uh, pixel IJ and plane K, uh, the values will be either zero or um, the two closest values will be non-zero and we can interpolate between them. Um, there is also the question here, so why, why do we do it? And the reason we do it is, is uh, when we simulate uh, optical systems, sometimes they are not differentiable. And thus we cannot use them in optimization. So this is, uh, um, our method here, here is trying to uh, approximate the actual um, imaging system in order to make it uh, differentiable and using it uh, through the optimization. So uh, kind of in the middle to sum up, we have a zero-shot method that we don't rely on any data sets. Instead, we rely on image priors with the generator and optical priors or knowledge of our imaging system. And thus, we're not limited for any of the existing data sets because we're not training it supervisedly. And we can adapt efficiently to new domains. In, addi in addition, uh, uh, another advantage is that we can extract both the pixel level and the depth map simultaneously uh, uh, altogether. Uh, so now to see some results. I'll start with some simulation results for depth estimation and restock the orient focus image, and then I'll go over to real world uh, results. So we use our uh, agent data set, as I said before, and uh, we compare it to a different, uh, uh, to a previous method that used the same um, um, imaging system, but again, used this uh, supervised scheme uh, that I talked about. And you can see that uh, uh, DPCIP performs much better in terms of foreground objects and background objects, and we even add this error map uh, per pixel so you can see it much more clearly. Um, also for a reconstruction, the all-in focus image, uh, we compare ourselves to uh, another previous work that used the same imaging system and the same training scheme, and you can see uh, uh, that we produce much sharper images uh, on over the hand and over the on the floor, you can see it much more clearly. Here we even try, and since this was an old work, we even trying to uh, improve it and introduce a new architecture, a new optimization technique. But still, we improved greatly over the original baseline, but couldn't. Uh, uh, but still, our zero-shot method outperformed it as well. Now, for our real-world uh, uh, results, um, we actually took images that uh, uh, taken from the camera I've shown before. Uh, the first baseline is the baseline I showed uh, in the simulation results. And the second baseline is uh, we tried to take uh, depth from the focus uh, uh, with learned optics. And of course, we couldn't use the provided, uh, um, the provided uh, checkpoints and, and the code uh, uh, since it's a whole new uh, imaging system, so we have to retrain it over our data. And this is a nice case showing that since our data was uh, much smaller than the original data, uh, the results are not uh, as good as expected. And you can see that our zero-shot method still produce uh, fairly well results again, without any data sets. Uh, we do the same for the ex uh, extended depth of field. And maybe to sum up uh, our main takeaways. So we propose, again, self-supervised approach for solving uh, uh, vision problems using phase-coded imaging. Uh, we do that by incorporating uh, the, the optic knowledge in the optimization scheme. And we, uh, um, and we do it, uh, um, the all optimization at once. And due, uh, due to our zero-shot method, we don't need any data sets, so we can better adapt to new domains, and we could be much more useful for many uh, applications where we have a domain gap. And, and again, our method extracts both uh, all in focus and depth maps, uh, which is great. Our code is publicly available, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
invited talk is from Jiamin Wu from Tsinghua University. He will talk about computational light field imaging for microscopy. So, yeah, thanks for the introduction. And uh, thanks for the committee for the great effort in organizing such a fancy conference. So it's my great honor to be here to present our recent work uh, in computational light field microscopy for metal scale intravital microscopy. Um, so let's first uh, talk about the motivation. So what we are going to do with uh, computational imaging methods. So the basic motivation for us is we want to see how different kinds of cells interact with each other at the organ level. So a typical example is in the uh, it's in the, like for different kinds of birds. So you can see each bird has their own behavior, but when they uh, come together, they will have some group behavior emerge uh, from the interaction of different. Okay, thank you. Because how do I do? Oh, this one? Yes. Oh, use this one. Um, oh, you yeah, have one, sorry. Okay, Never yeah, mind. okay. <laughs> Yeah, so when different kind of bird interact with us, it will emerge like new behaviors, like the different group behaviors. For in our human body, like a typical example is in the brain. So we know each brain, each neuron quite uh, good, but when different kinds of brains interact with each other, they're connected and form a neural network, it will emerge new properties such as uh, consciousness or intelligence. So this kind of uh, phenomenon, we need first to observe this kind of phenomenon, how different kinds of neurons respond. So in that case, we can understand how how our brain works and during this process. So, so we call mass of scale imaging. So what is mass of scale imaging? So it's a, uh, there's basically two directions in the uh, microscopy. So one direction is gradually uh, increasing like spatial resolution of current microscopy. So a typical example is a, a super resolution for resistance microscopy and the cry-EM. So the uh, scientists like visualize a single cell and to see how different uh, kinds of proteins and organelles interact with each other inside the single cell. So the system, the whole system is a single cell and to see how they behavior. So another direction is fMRI and the CT. So we have a whole body imaging and to see how interaction of different kinds of organs. So we call mass of scale is like we want to see at the organ level, like a whole organ and to see how different kinds of cells as a basic unit and different kinds of cells interact with each other to doing these kinds of things. I think uh, Fei has already previously introduced like how fluorescence imaging works. So we, I do not take too much into fluorescence imaging work. So we are just talking about the challenges of how to realize mass of scale intravital fluorescence imaging. So it's basically like three different kinds of challenges. So one challenge is like 3D distribution inside. So we do not take the cells outside in cultural cells imaging. So we want to see the native behavior of these kind of cells inside the organs, how different size cells behavior. So it's, it's 3D distributed. So we need high speed 3D imaging uh, with a very high super 2D sensor, so how to realize it. So another thing is the phototoxicity, as uh, people mentioned before, like the UV light may hurt like the cells. When we do long term high speed imaging, we excite the light and generate fluorescence. But when we do continuous excitation of the light, it will hurt the cell itself. How can we reduce the phototoxicity and to achieve long term and high speed imaging? So the third thing is like, how can we achieve wide field resolution and high resolution imaging at the same time? It usually takes very complex and large lenses and to achieve high spatial bandwidth imaging for this kind of system. So that's why we're working for the computational imaging to solve this problem. So since traditional like optics is highly rely on the basic concept is like what you see is what you get. It's every point in the, sen uh, in the sample and need to be relayed by the imaging system to every point into the sensor. So, but now since we have detection with the sensor and detectors, PMT, spell different kinds of detectors. So we can now use uh, computational imaging methods and to do, to solve this kind of problem. So what we do here, we are using the live imaging. So it's first proposed by the Gabriel Liebman uh, in about 1911 and then integrate, uh, we call it an integral imaging and then further develop, first apply uh, by Mark Lavoie in 2005 in microscopy, developed the first live view microscopy in this area, but in static samples. And Edward Boyden and Ali Pasavadri applied this technique in the neural imaging for the first 3D imaging of the C elegant zebrafish, but it's uh, still transparent samples. 
So when we try to apply this live field imaging in microscopy, we found there is a fundamental problem, a current light field microscopy. Because like in our normal photography, we can treat all the light as a rays if we use geometric optics is enough. But when we try to push the resolution into the single cell or subcellular level and to see the cellular behaviors, so it meets a diffraction effect. So uh, so it's a, we found there's a fundamental trade-off in live view micro imaging. It's not only limited by the total pixel number. It's also limited by the uncertainty principle, or we call diffraction limit. It means like if you want to achieve very high spatial resolution, you will lose the precision in the localization of the angular momentum. In other words, it means that if you want to achieve high resolution, we need to collect as more angles as possible. In that case, you can achieve a high numeric capture uh, to achieve a high, uh, uh, high resolution. But if you want to achieve the angular resolution, I mean, collect all the light rays, all the live view information, so you need to divide the whole aperture into different sub-aptures. So in this case, we will reduce the numeric capture, and the spatial resolution will be reduced. So it's very typical for incoherent imaging, and fluorescence is a very uh, typical in coherent imaging, not coherent imaging. So how to bypass this limit? So we were inspired um, by a very interesting phenomenon uh, in the Drosophila. So we find that like, uh, when Drosophila resolve high frequency information, it's not only rely on the micro lens array uh, in the compound eyes. It's also a very interesting phenomenon and we call photomechanical response. It means like all the photoreceptors of the Drosophila, when they receive the light rays, it will generate high speed drifting. And this kind of high speed drifting can help the software to resolve high frequency information. If we broke this kind of photomechanical response, it cannot resolve uh, high frequency information. So we find that like, this kind of drifting is very important to increase the resolution of live view imaging or the compound eyes. So we apply this technique in live view microscopy. So we make the micro lens array high speed drifting, and we find, yeah, it really can increase the spatial resolution uh, of the traditional live view microscopy and to the, up to the diffraction limit uh, with still high angular resolution. So what's the, what's the physics behind this kind of uh, phenomenon? So why we can preserve the high resolution when we do pupil segmentation, even with a small pneumo capture? So we find this highly rely on the small size of the micro lens. It means like we need to fabricate the micro lens very small. In this case, it will generate diffraction. So it's very similar like the structural illumination microscopy. So it's an incoherent light field. When the incoherent light field passes through the lenses, it will go through the micro lens array. It's a periodic micro lens array. It's like a diffraction grating. So when it goes through the micro lens array, it will create frequency aliasing. It will generate high frequency information, shift this high frequency information into a low frequency region. Then we do pupil segmentation, it's a low pass filter, so we can still maintain this kind of high frequency information in the low frequency region and go pass through the, this low pass filter even after pupil segmentation. And in then, we can do shifting of the micro lens array. So it's very similar like in digital holography and the structural emission, it's like a phase shifting of the sample. So we can retrieve uh, the phase information and separate this kind of frequency aliasing uh, during this process and retrieve the high frequency information. In this case, this kind of phase shifting or the drifting is not like some pixel shifting. So it means like we do not need a full sampling of this kind of dense shifting. We only need here like a three by three shifting. We can recover the resolution up to 15 by 15 uh, each sensor pixels of each micro lens. So recover the whole uh, resolution up to the diffraction limit. Here is a typical example for the um, imaging, we call this scanning live view imaging. So it's a typical example of the live view detection where each micro lens can cover different angle resolution. So when we do drifting, we use a, a gravel mirror to do high speed drifting because if we do mechanical drifting, it will lose the temporal resolution. But if we do high speed drifting with a gravel, it can do up to the kilohertz high speed drifting. Then we do pixel realignment so we can make it into a phase space or different angular views. After drifting, it can generate a high resolution information with a dense sampling of the micro lens array. It's not limited by the micro lens array pitch, so we can up to the diffraction limit for the scanning. But we only need three by three scanning. We can recover uh, the whole uh, resolution for the 3D imaging of these kind of samples. So based on this kind of technique, 
Uh, so we can recover like the 3D information of this kind of samples, uh, push the resolution of traditional live field microscopy uh, up to the diffraction limit of the samples. So here's a very uh, interesting phenomenon. When the cell migrates, it will generate these kind of retraction fibers, and uh, there is generated like extracellular vesicles on these kind of retraction fibers. We call that microsomes. But it's very hard to be observed in the in vivo. So we uh, with the scanning life imaging, we can observe this phenomenon for the first time in vivo. Here's in the mouse liver in vivo imaging. Uh, we use the yellow color to label the uh, neutrophiles, a kind of immune cell, and uh, uh, use uh, red color to label the vessels in the liver so we can do continuous high-speed 3D imaging, maintain like subcellular resolution to the cellular behaviors. So in, in this case, we can do high-speed 3D imaging up to the diffraction limit. So another advantage we find for this kind of scanning life imaging is it very high, has very low phototoxicity. Why it has low phototoxicity? Because compared with a wide view imaging or confocal imaging, uh, when we do fluorescence imaging, when you excite the whole 3D volume, but only a single layer is effective photons because the photons will disperse very quickly, and its high-frequency OTF will degrade very quickly when it's going to out of focus. Um, it's similar in confocal microscopy, we are rejecting the out of focus photons. So it means that like, we excite the 3D, but only a single layer is effective. So light sheet solves this problem by only exciting a single layer and detecting the single layer, it has very low phototoxicity. Then in live view microscopy, we, can, we find that like, we can keep the photons a focus in the extended depth of field. It means like the photons are still keep focus and uh, uh, in the extended depth of field uh, compared with traditional wide field detection. So all the photons in the 3D in the effective depth range are still effective photons. So it has very efficiency for this kind of imaging, uh, for 3D imaging. So we compare with scanning live field microscopy with traditional two photon microscopy and spinning disk confocal microscopy. You can see the yellow color is a, a sensitive dye. It will keep bleaching very quickly with the light excitation and the dive uh, intensity will gradually decrease due to the bleaching effect, something like phototoxicity. But with scanning live view microscopy, we can keep imaging with very high speed and uh, several hours and keep imaging. There's almost no significant photo bleaching. So in that case, we can do high speed long term imaging by minimizing the phototoxicity of this uh, process and to do high speed long term imaging. So another problem during this process is like when the samples move very fast. A typical example is when the cells uh, is inside the blood vessels. It will be washed out uh, by the blood. It's a very high speed phenomenon. It's something also like the heart beating very high speed. So it will generate motion artifacts in this process. So uh, a typical since we have drifting of the microns, so it will generate motion artifacts. And then we can develop a neural network to make like a one to nine frames. It's a three by three periodical scanning. So we can use one to nine frames as one volume and two to 10 frames as another volume and with neural network to synthesize uh, this process. And then we can achieve, a uh, eliminate this kind of motion artifacts and still maintain uh, the uh, 3D imaging speed up to the camera frame rate. And so in that case, we can resolve subcellular performance even during a very high speed process. So another uh, limit is uh, background for residents. So when we do in vivo imaging, there's lots of uh, scattering photons and out of photo photos or with dense labeling of fluorescence imaging. So we also combine line scanning confocal microscopy uh, inside with scanning live field microscopy. The basic concept is like, since we now have 3D imaging, so in, con line, in confocal microscopy, we only take a single layer, reject out of focus photons, but in this case, we only reject the out of focus photons out of the effective depth range. And it's coupled with the loading shutter of the sensor. Uh, so we have a line scanning, but this line can excite a 3D line. It's quite wide line excitation. So it's synchronized with the loading shutter of the sensor. So in that case, or we can reject the background fluorescence imaging of this kind of samples. Here, here's a typical example. So we do the scan, still keep doing the scanning. So each image, so it's uh, after uh, background rejection. Sorry, I think there's some problem. So after pixel realignment, still gets the image. But after we synchronize it with the line confocal, so we can greatly suppress this kind of background fluorescence signals and make the uh, live view reconstruction very robust compared with uh, traditional uh, live view microscope imaging, especially in the in vivo conditions, uh, native intravital environment. So it's a much higher uh, image contrast compared with uh, a traditional scanning live view microscopy. 
And uh, with this case, so we can do very high speed 3D imaging, uh, even with dense ray pooling. Here, sample is with uh, voltage imaging. It's uh, like a membrane potential, like the electricity membrane potential of the neurons, very high speed. Here's a, two, three, a 200 hertz 3D imaging. It's uh, in the Drosophila, cover the whole brain. So with the labeling of several neurons, in traditional scanning life in microscopy, due to a scattering, uh, we cannot have very high contrast to maintain the subcellular resolution. But after rejection of this kind of background fluorescence and with scanning life in microscopy, so we can achieve like 200 hertz 3D imaging with high contrast uh, to resolve this kind of subcellular behavior, uh, even for the voltage signals. So the third question here is like, as I mentioned before, it's the system aberrations. It means like when we try to achieve very wide field of view and high resolution at the same time, so we usually need to fabricate it, fabricate very complex and large lenses and takes cost a lot. And uh, we have done that before. In about 29, 2019, we have a paper published in Nature Photonics we call Rush System. So uh, we try to get gigapixel for resonance microscope. You can see it's a, a very huge imaging system. And it's a similar height as me. It's, it's even higher than me. It's a very huge system. Uh, but now we can easily get giga, near gigapixel sensor like Sony and uh, some company. But how to make this kind of complex imaging system much smaller? And, uh, still maintain high efficiency and 3D imaging capability. So we find uh, like uh, uh, another uh, advantage of live view microscopy is like when we can reach diffraction limit with standing live view microscopy, it means like we can have very high precision to manipulate each light rays. So compared with traditional 2D imaging, what we can get is only a 2D imaging. But when, now we can get a very high precision uh, 4D distribution of the light view, even for the incoherent light. So we can manipulate each light rays in post-processing uh, to do this kind of aberration correction. Uh, a typical example is like this. When, when there's optical aberrations, we will make the image blur. And, but if we can capture the whole four-dimensional information, you can see these kind of optical aberrations will generate disparities in different views. So we can use this, diff this kind of disparity to estimate what kind of local aberration it is uh, in the local region, and we can estimate the aberration. Once we get this kind of aberration, we can apply this aberration back and to shift the light rays into perfect focus and to create, crack these kind of optical aberrations. So we call this process like digital adaptive optics. So we make a small sensor we call meta imaging sensor. Uh, we couple a micro lens array in a piezo, uh, in a piezo stage, uh, very small, and attach it to the sensor. And then we code a mask in each micro lens array. That is to increase the diffraction effect of each micro lens array. As I mentioned before, uh, with the diffraction effect, we can couple more higher frequency information into low frequency region, maintain the high frequency information. So we call this sensor meta imaging sensor. So it's like ultra-high precision detection of the four-dimensional live view. So com compare with the traditional 2D sensor and live view microscopy with optical aberrations. So this kind of sensor can achieve a diffraction limit even with uh, very strong uh, optical aberrations. So here's a uh, basic uh, demonstration. So in traditional adaptive optics, we will put a deformed mirror to crack these kind of aberrations. Um, but different field of view, they will go through the same pupil plan. But uh, in that case, we can only crack the local aberration. It means like aberration is highly spatially non-uniform. You can only crack the local aberration in traditional adaptive optics. But with digi digital adaptive optics, since we can capture the four-dimensional information without reducing the imaging acquisition speed. So we can do multi-site aberration correction in post-processing at the same time and maintain high resolution. And here's a comparison. Uh, this is simulation. Here's a comparison with the traditional 2D sensor with very strong optical aberrations and with uh, hardware adaptive optics correction and digital adaptive optics. So it can achieve like, similar performance with hardware adaptive optics with accurate estimation of the optical aberrations. So here is the uh, experimental data. So we compare like the uh, digital adaptive optics with traditional De Bruyne algorithms. In traditional De Bruyne algorithms, it has two, two main differences. So one difference like uh, uh, with uh, four-dimensional live view detection, so we can have very accurate estimation of the point space function of the optical aberrations because it's reflected in the disparity of different multi-views. But in traditional 2D imaging, it's very hard to estimate very complicated optical aberrations. That's one thing. Another thing is like we find like the meta-imaging sensor itself is very robust 
to the optic aberrations. It means like even there's very strong optic aberrations. So the last law is the law data. So we can find uh, like one view of the sensor uh, within the same aberrations. It can still maintain quite high imaging quality uh, compared with the traditional uh, 2D sensor during this process. So these two advantages make it very robust uh, to the optical aberrations. So as I mentioned before, we designed this technique. We try to reduce the cost and size of the very large microscope. So with this technique, so we can achieve gigapixel imaging with only a single lens, we can still maintain gigapixel performance. But in traditional 2D sensors, you can see in the center field view, uh, it's OK, has quite good uh, spatial resolution compared uh, with the meta-imaging sensor. But in the age of the field view, uh, due to the increasing of the optical aberrations, so the resolution degrade very quickly. Uh, but with the meta-imaging sensor, we can still maintain a very high optical, uh, high spatial resolution up to the diffraction limit uh, for this kind of aberration correction, even with very strong optical aberrations. So we apply this technique uh, in the mouse in vivo imaging. This is the whole cortex of the mouse. It's about one centimeter uh, by one centimeter. And we can, every local region uh, can be further zoomed in to see the single cells uh, of, each, of each neuron. Here's a, uh, layer two, three specific labeling of the, of the neurons. And uh, so it's a, you can see the neuron is firing. So it's a GCAMP indicator. So when the neuron has a uh, neural activity, like uh, the fluorescent intensity will increase. So we can achieve like cortex-wide 3D neural recording uh, to record like the uh, hundreds of thousands of neurons at the same time uh, for the 3D imaging rack of this process. So instead of, uh, in addition to the neural imaging, we can also see here's a traumatic brain injury model. It's a, also a whole cortex. Uh, the red color is labeled the blood in the vessels, and there's a, uh, sorry, it's a green color. The red color is labeled the neutrophils. When there's a heat in the brain, it's a traumatic brain injury. You can see lots of immune cells will migrate inside into the brain tissue and through this process. And we can do 3D imaging across the long term, like several hours, maintain high speed uh, 3D imaging. And also we can make a, a very high resolution so it's not a stitch uh, tissue. So it's a uh, high-speed 3D imaging across a very large field of view. Uh, so the, it's in the mouse liver, it's in vivo imaging. So the, after reconstruction, this is uh, raw data. And after reconstruction, we can get uh, uh, 3D information of this kind of samples. And, uh, and the red color is the vessels in the mouse liver. And the green color is uh, labeled the neutrophils in the vessel during the EMU response. So every local region can be further zoomed in and to see this process. And it's dynamic. It means like it's a dynamic, continuous uh, 3D imaging for this kind of gigapixel uh, 3D imaging in the, across a very large field of view. So in that case, uh, we can understand how different kind of cells uh, interact with each other uh, during different uh, EMU response and during this process. I think the video is quite... Um, quite long. So every local region uh, can be further zoomed in. You can see the, all the cells. Uh, it's a uh, migrate and it's intact uh, with different kind of cells, uh, continuous imaging, and uh, across a uh, uh, large field of view uh, with millisecond scale uh, 3D imaging speed. And we can keep imaging for several hours and without photo bleaching. So we can do a long term high speed uh, imaging of these uh, processes. So, and this technique can not only be applied in the uh, in the microscope, it can also be applied in the astronomy since adaptive optics is widely accepted in the uh, astronomy. So we attach this sensor into a ground-based telescope and to crack the uh, atmospheric turbulence uh, introduce uh, environmental aberrations. But in traditional 2D sensor, it will uh, reduce like the spatial resolution and reduce the uh, uh, imaging contrast. And, uh, but after cracking, we do not need to modify the existing ground-based telescope only need to attach this sensor so we can do multi-site aberration correction uh, at the same time and do high-speed recording. And with uh, high-speed estimation of these samples, uh, so we can even observe like the direct observation of the atmospheric turbulence because it's transparent, but uh, it's very hard. So we need passive detection. But when we image the moon, so we can see the disparity uh, between different views. So we can use the, these uh, clues to estimate like different local regions, we can obtain very high precision of this kind of uh, uh, optical aberrations. With, uh, we call that wide field view, uh, wavefront sensing. Uh, we can obtain the, you can see the uh, flow of this kind of uh, atmospheric turbulence with the uh, changing of the optical aberrations. 
yeah, I think it's a time, it's a limit. I will quickly go through the last step. Also, we need to do deep tissue imaging as a scattering how to achieve deep tissue imaging. So we apply similar technique in the two-photon microscopy. So as similar as uh, FE, but we elongate the light rays, a point scanning, make it a needle light scan, uh, scanning. But we change the directions of this kind of needle light so we can achieve a live field excitation uh, instead of live field detection. So we can achieve, uh, combined with the two-photon excitation, we can achieve very uh, deep tissue penetration, uh, maintain the, with total collection. So it uh, can penetrate similar deep penetration uh, as the traditional two-photon microscopy, but with a 3D excitation. And since you two have the location of the light rays, so you can easily get the 3D information after the tomography algorithms to achieve the 3D information of this kind of samples. And it also can do digital adaptive optics with this kind of scattering. So it's a similar penetration depth as the traditional uh, two-photon microscopy, and it's very robust to the uh, optical aberrations. With a water immersion objective, uh, even we re remove this kind of water, uh, we can still maintain high contrast and high resolution. And uh, uh, in this case, different kinds, yeah, uh, quickly go through, yeah. So we can do some imaging and high speed long term imaging in the lymph node to track the B cell and C cell, uh, T cell interactions. Yeah, so that's uh, basic information where we are working on. We try to do, apply computational imaging techniques, basically like computational live view imaging techniques uh, in the microscopy to observe, to analyze how different kinds of cells interact with each other at the organ level. I'm welcome for all the questions. Thank you. Very cool work. Um, in the you know, parts where you're shifting the, the pixel to increase the resolution, yeah. could you get the same effect with just using a high, you know, smaller pixel pitch, or do you really need the shift to, to super resolve the light field? Thing? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So at currently, we still need shifting. The reason is if we reduce the pixel size, there's a F number of the micro rental array. So that will limit like the resolution of the, uh, of the, after the micro lens array. It means like if you further increase, uh, reduce the pixel size, it doesn't matter because it's uh, limited by the diffraction limit of the micro lens array. Um, but it's uh, also a very interesting point. What we're doing here is we have a defective pattern on the micro lens array. So it will further increase its uh, high frequency component. So in this case, we can use smaller pixel size to avoid scanning. So we do, we do not need scanning, but we need only need small pixel size. It's a very, Good question. Thank you. Um, nice talk. I'm here. Um, I have one question regarding your two photon sensor, like where you uh, seems like you move from uh, use the same sensor from one p to two p. Yeah. Um, uh, no, not same sensor. It's a different sensor. But uh, it's, a, it's an area yeah, sensor. Yeah, it's, right? uh, it's a change the excitation path. So it's a two photon is excitation. So it's not detection is still total detection oh, with a single PMT. Oh, so PMT. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, waveform shaping of the modulation of the light rays into different angles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, yeah. Okay. I have a quick question. Like, uh, uh, like how is the similarity between the scanning light field microscopy and the array scan? I feel these two are uh, you both use the pixel reassignment. Uh, are these similar techniques? Oh, every scan, but it's still 2D imaging. So it's a very tight depth of field. So it's 2D imaging for every scan. But uh, um, by in scanning live field microscopy, we extend the live field. So it's an extended depth of field. So we can achieve 3D imaging. So I think that's a main difference for. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay, so we are at the lunch break. Don't forget, before you can get your lunch, we will love to take our group photo. So to make it a bit interesting, we change plans. So basically, go by the reception and line up on the other side along the balcony, and we take the photo from here. So the volunteers will guide you, but just go around. 
And then for those of you who signed up for, for the industrial consortium, your food is already in the room. So we, it's going to be an SG0 and your food is already in the room. So for those of you who signed up for the industrial consortium.